Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. During this blessed month of Shahr Ramadan, we at Imam Hussein Development and Relief Foundation are looking to provide food baskets for families living in poverty in and around the blessed city of Karbala. Each food basket contains a variety of essential food supplies that is sufficient to feed roughly a family of four for just about 10 days. By donating 20 pounds per food basket, you can play a role in ensuring that nobody living in the city of Imam Al Hussein ever misses an iftar due to poverty. Contribute today and play a part through our website at www.ihdrf.org or follow us for updates on this campaign for Shahrul Ramadan through our social media. May our two masters, Imam Al Hussein and Al Abbas, reward each and every one of you abundantly during this blessed month of Shahrul Ramadan as you work to elevate poverty from the great city of Karbala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Last night we discussed male hijab in the Quran, and tonight we discuss female hijab in the Quran. We all know very well that the ladies in our community are no doubt the flag bearers of the religion of Islam because they are the ones most identified with the religion because of the veil that they wear. I don't think any of us can deny that. If I walk in the street today in London, I could be mistaken for being a Muslim or a non-Muslim. But when my sister walks in the streets in London, or my sister walks in the streets anywhere in the world, or when our sisters, for example, are at an airport somewhere, or they're at a particular college or a particular university, everybody from a mile away can identify them as a Muslim. And that means that first and foremost, there has to be an unbelievable amount of respect from ourselves towards those in the Muslim community who have held the flag of the religion of Islam. Our sisters, our mothers, our daughters, nieces, etc., etc. And indeed you find that it's not only our religion that has discussed, for example, a particular type of veil to be worn as a symbol of modesty. We know very well that you may find Orthodox Jews may have at one point or another discussed the importance of a covering as a form of modesty. And you may find in Christianity until today you may see a nun crossing the street and straight away she's a symbol for Christianity. But there's no doubt that the symbol that is the hijab as we know it today and I want underlined as we know it today is probably the symbol which is the most controversial politically that until today there are certain countries in the world within their legal systems that ask the question that in a vision for a secularized society should something which is as blatant a symbol of religion as hijab be banned or is it something that should be allowed should we allow ladies who, for example, are serving us food at a restaurant to wear a veil or a covering? Or is it that this should not be in the workplace at all? There are some countries in Europe that until today discuss this. Until today, the hijab, the veil, the covering, the headscarf, whatever we want to call it, from the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, until today, 
is a subject of controversy in certain countries. I cannot deny that there are certain non-Muslim countries who won't bat an eyelid. They'll have respect for you, irrespective of what you wear, which sometimes can be good and sometimes can be bad as well. They'll just say to you that, listen, don't stick it in my face. You want to go out clubbing on a Friday night and wear as little as you want, and you want to cover yourself from head to toe, no problem whatsoever. So you find in this country, for example, you could go to your local cafe and sit there, and you may find a Muslim sister by the name of Fatima sitting there, and she may be covered from head to toe with an extra covering, a covering that we may call the burqa, for example, or the burqa. The burqa, or some may refer to it as even the niqab, let's say a covering of the face. The burqa is even mentioned in Jahili poetry. So even within the poetry of the days of Jahiliya, there is a mention of the Arabs that some of their ladies, for example, used to even cover their faces. And so I may be sitting in a cafe with my friends and I may see a sister who's sitting there and she's covered from head to toe. Even her whole face is covered. And I may see right across her, across from Sister Fatima, is Sister Zainab who's sitting there and she's not covered herself at all. Because she may come from a school of thought that says, that I've seen YouTube videos that says, or that say that there is nothing on hijab in the Quran. Sometimes you get those arguments, that bro, show me in the Quran. Where does it say that I have to cover my head? And that's why in the Muslim world, when you, as a Muslim or as a non-Muslim, talk about a Muslim, a Muslim can be religious, not religious, cultural, traditional, learned, not so learned, developing into religiosity, not interested in religiosity, Muslim because of mom and dad, Muslim because of reading. And so therefore, when I'm looking at this, I may find that the development of the discussion of the veil in Islam on the one hand, becomes more important because of the doubts that are raised as to whether you should wear or you shouldn't. On the other hand, because as a father or mother who may be watching this, they may have in their families a young girl and she's coming towards the age of adolescence. And we know when you come towards the age of adolescence or you come towards the age of bulur, suddenly things change. Suddenly responsibilities begin for you as a Muslim. Now, one thing I've always noticed, in my years growing up, I don't think if you had asked me, explain to me the headscarf or the veil from the Quran, I don't think I was able to. Certainly not with the knowledge that I have, alhamdulillah, today. But I think many Muslims, if you actually sat with them and say, listen, you've got this Quran, you all admire it, it's 114 chapters, explain to me from there why my sister should cover her head. I don't think many Muslims, including scholars, have necessarily explained the evolution of what we know today, underline what we know today, of hijab. I think the way hijab was introduced to many of us was too black and white without any shades of grey. Too black and white. Islam says you have to wear hijab and there's absolutely no doubt about that whatsoever. There's only two chapters I would argue in tonight's session that discuss what we know today as hijab. I think I've repeated in the first 10 minutes of this discussion, what we know today. Because there are many different words that the Arabs would use in relation to covering. Sitr, for example, is a word that was used by Sayyidah Zainab salam in front of Yazid. Because Yazid, what did he do? The sitr, the covering of Al Muhammad, he attacked it. She doesn't say hatakta hijabahun. Hatakta sutura. That you are the one who has attacked the sitter. So sitter is a word for covering. The Arabs used to have this word as well called khimar. It was a form of head covering. 
That's another word for what we call today as hijab. Awra. Many of us use that in fiqh discussions. That's something else. Even a malhafa, one may argue. You know, you have lahaf. Iraqis will know lahaf. You may have, for example, I don't know, a duvet cover or something. Or something like a shawl that you can cover with. And you have this term hijab. I don't believe that we have discussed the evolution of the veil and we've made it so black and white that there are no spaces for discussing the different points in which the early Muslim community, transport yourself back because this book is 1400 years ago. So I want us to transport ourselves back. The first ayah of the Quran, did it say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? Read in the name of your Lord who created. Wear hijab now. Can anyone tell me that in the first verses in Mecca, when the Prophet was 40 years of age, did a verse come down there and then about hijab? No. Nope. Can you tell me exactly that these ladies living when the Quran was revealed were wearing amazing what we call Abaya or chador or mantu or hijab like we have today. Can you tell me that all the Arab ladies were wearing amazing hijabs at that time when the Quran was revealed? Listen, we're talking a very jahili society. And these guys were very physically active, in some cases promiscuous, moving from partners or having at least a number of ladies around them, <coughs> merrymaking and enjoying can you tell me exactly how their covering looked like when the Quran was revealed? Is there any mention of the veil or the headscarf when Surah, for example, Alaq is revealed? No. After Alaq, which Surah was revealed after Alaq? Let's say, for example, Surah like Al-Qalam or Muzammil or Muddathir or Al-Fatiha. If I was to tell you, show me any ayah in those Surah which tell me how to cover would you show me any in those early suwar no because the main two chapters that discuss hijab as we know it today or the way that you interact in the world view of modesty in islam both socially and physically are either surat al-ahzab or surat al-nur either surat al-ahzab or nur Nur and Ahzab are not revealed until at least, at least, at least, I'd say 19 years after Islam began. The surahs that discuss hijab, khimar, aura, are revealed 19 years after Islam begun. I think the first point we all need to get is God wasn't walking around with an iron rod at the beginning of Islam telling his prophet, if a lady has one hair sticking out, go kill her. Nor was God saying that someone cannot develop into wearing the right type of covering. My prophet didn't discuss it until 19 years in. There are many who assume that the Islamic legal system was all set in stone right at the beginning of when the religion was revealed. Then how is this book revealed? The book is revealed step by step. Do you agree? The verses are revealed step by step. And so therefore, when I'm looking at the female hijab in the Quran as we know it today as hijab, our terminologies sometimes are the ones that cause us problems. We need to understand that the main discussions concerning it becoming shari'i, legal, and the main discussions concerning not doing it becoming a ma'siyah, all seem to come to us 19 years after Islam was announced. There was no ayah as soon as Islam was revealed saying now every lady in Arabia has to wear an abaya. They certainly weren't wearing abayas. You want to see cleavage? You can go there. Cleavage. I'm saying that they're wearing low-cut tops. 
in some cases very light material. Yes, there are families who may have come from particular levels of modesty because sometimes you don't need religion to have a family of class in what they wear. I can find a non-Muslim family in the world who don't know anything about hijab, don't know anything about these things, but their daughters dress with a real respect. When you're at university, didn't you meet some ladies or some of the sisters at university? A sister who goes to the mosque may not have as good hijab as a lady who's not even a Muslim. Therefore, the discussion of the female's hijab in the Qur'an we're talking 19 years in. How old would Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi have been 19 years after he announced this prophethood? How old, Yasser? 59. Ahsant. He'd be 59. My Lord, why is it taking so long to talk about this? Noor? Ahzab. You could have mentioned it even earlier. And what's interesting when we look at the verses, my dear brothers and sisters who are watching at home, let's go straight to the verses which are discussing <coughs> the different varieties of what we call today hijab. Because I don't think at that time, when God's speaking to that community in Medina, I don't think everybody's going around saying, you're not wearing proper hijab. Do you get me? I don't think... You know, you're going around and you're saying to people, you're not wearing proper hijab. Because even the words which are being used to discuss it, we still haven't got to a stage where we're set in stone hijab. Hijab comes later. But the word hijab is mentioned in the Quran. But the word hijab being mentioned in the Quran on most occasions has nothing to do with covering your head at all. Actually, when God begins talking about modesty, how does he begin by talking about modesty? First... Talking to the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because if the wives of the man who's bought this religion themselves aren't covered properly, then how do I expect the community to be covered properly? Go to Surah 33, all of us, please. <coughs> Surah 33, verse number 32. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Everybody at home. Surah 33, verse 32. Ya Nisa al-Nabi. O wives of the Prophet. You are not like any other wives. If you stop there, that means there's no one greater than the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. True? If I stop there. That means that there is no one like the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi Except if I stop there. If I stop there, that means there's none like them. If I continue, if you have taqwa, Otherwise, you're like any other ladies. You're a lady, she is a lady. At the end of the day, if you don't have taqwa, you don't have consciousness of Allah. What did we say yesterday? We said was the best ever form of hijab. Libasa taqwa. Didn't we say that last night? The garment that's called taqwa. God consciousness. Ya nisa al-nabi lastunna ka ahadin min al-nisa in al-taqaytunna. Fala. The first form of hijab. What is it? The way you talk. فَلَا تَخْضَعْنَ بِالْقَوْلِ فَيَطْمَعَ الَّذِي فِي قَلْبِهِ مَرَضٌ وَقُلْنَ قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا O oh, wives of the Prophet! First, let's address the man whose family is around him. Let's see how they are in the way their hijab is. But not the covering of the head. We're still not there. At the beginning, we're talking about the way they interact with each other because 50% of female hijab in the Quran is social. If I'm someone who's covered from head to toe and I'm flirtatious with somebody else, for example, or I'm soft in my speech depending who I'm talking to, then that doesn't con become the hijab that the Quran was looking for. O wives of the Prophet, Because the one who in their heart is a disease, which is 99.9% .9 of men, the one in whose heart there is a disease is going to be affected. You see, if a lady goes to me, I go, Lek! Shlonek! So I'll be like, so I'll be like, yeah, yeah, I'm cool, yeah. And she says, Habib Albi Kifak. 
And she could still say Habib Albi Kifak like that, but she could also soften her speech in the way she says it. Kifak Habib Albi. And I see all of you who are fasting suddenly woke up, and I'm a guy with a deep, ugly voice who's saying it. <coughs> I said Habib Albi Kifak. I've got four, five guys in front of me suddenly woke up. Now you transfer, remove someone like me, and get someone good looking over here, and who sits and speaks with a soft voice and says to you, Habib Albi Kifak. At that moment, even the guys at the back will say, Ya Allah, I am a Sa'im, please forgive me. The Quran said what? Hijab isn't just to be limited to covering because you could be covered from head to toe. But here, the one with whose heart there's a disease, 99% of men, they will be affected by this straight away. Then next verse, the next verse, all of us normally recite it, especially Shia. Shia love the next verse. But Shia, when we recite the next verse, we normally don't realize something. That the next verse, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ Allah begins, in the, it's in the middle of the ayah. The beginning of the ayah says what? وَقَرْنَا Verse 33 of Surah 33. فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَ تَبَرُّجَ الْجَاهَلِيَةِ الْأُولَى Stay in your houses, O oh wives of the Prophet, and don't display your finery like you displayed in the days of, like the display of the ignorance or the days of the ignorance. Wala tabarajna tabarruj. The wives of the Prophet are being told that number one, because you're the wives of the Prophet, peace be upon his family, there is an extra focus on your hijab. The way you talk with men in the community now, you are the first example we're going to address before we address the other sisters. First, don't be soft in your speech. Second, and do not display what? Don't have tabarruj. Maybe in the days of ignorance, your faces were full of makeup. You used to go out. Maybe your finer necklaces and rings and bracelets and everything was showing. That tabarruj ends now. So here we're introduced to the wives of the Prophet being the example for how modesty is to be built up. And then the wives of the Prophet alongside the believing ladies are introduced to a form of covering, 19 years in by the way, a form of covering which is to go a bit further than what the Arab ladies were wearing at the time. So let's say, you're an Arab lady at the time and you're wearing a piece of cloth. Like many Muslim ladies are wearing a piece of cloth at the time. So if I was to describe to you how the Arab lady is dressed at the time, they're covering their head. The ears are showing and the neck, this area here, which we will call it the jube. Okay? The chest cavity area. Okay? This area here between the chest and the neck. The Arab ladies, that was all showing. That showing is showing. But are they covering their hair? Yes. They've got like a bandana on their hair. So could you see their hair? No. I don't think so. The slave girls living in Medina at the time... Their hair was showing. You know, in, in that system, I've got one of my discussions coming up about the slaves in the Quran. There was a distinction made between if you were born free or if you were born a slave. We cannot deny that. Listen, I wish I can deny certain things that were present when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi had emerged. But there's no denying slavery was there like slavery was in America 100 years ago. It's there, okay? The slave Arab, her hair's all showing. Her hair's all out. The free Arab, the head is covered, but the ear is showing, and the neck up until the cleavage area is all showing. What would happen would be that the methylene, what they used to wear was one piece of clothing. That one piece of clothing. If it's light, what will the wind do? If I'm walking and the wind blows that light piece of methylene, dish dasha, jalabiya, whatever you want to wear, 
what would happen? It would blow away and then the shape would be clearly showing of that lady. But for those ladies at the time, many of them felt that they were quite modest because they're not letting their hair out as such. It's covered. And they inherited this. Maybe they inherited from the Northeast Arabians or from the, you know, the southern side of Iraq even. They, they inherited a certain custom of how they would dress. And that head covering they would have, what, what did I say the head covering was called? Just the head covering. What's it called? Khimar. Make sure you note that down. Head covering for the Arabs, just covering the head, was known as khimar. Is showing. Cleavage area open. The Quran had recognized this, but still wanted to insist to the wives of the Prophet that before we have an overhaul of this way that you're dressing, where there needs to be a bit of a change, a bit of a development. Still, one more thing. Don't take it too easy with people when you talk to them. Make sure there's a hijab between you and them. We're still talking to the wives of the Prophet. We haven't yet talked to all the believers. In the same surah, if you go to verse number 53, same surah, verse number 53 of the same surah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, it's his wedding. And he's getting married to a lady by the name of Zainab, the daughter of Jahsh. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, la tadkhulu buyuta al-nabi illa an yu'dhana lakum ila ta'amin ghayra nadhirina ina. O you who believe, don't enter the houses of the Prophet unless it's permitted for you for a meal without waiting for the Cooking to be finished. وَلَكِنْ إِذَا دُعِيتُمْ If you're invited in, فَادْخُلُوا فَإِذَا طَعِمْتُمْ فَانْتَشِرُوا وَلَا مُسْتَأْنَسِينَ لحديث. If however you are allowed in, then eat the food and then after that don't be a lesga. Munch, get out. I beg you don't be a lesga. Because some of these, it is going, خَبِسَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ has got married. And it could happen on your wedding day. You're just like, guys, you can all go home now. I want to chill. Nah, lazga. They used to say, lazga at alich abu saham. It used to be a alich. You know the, the alich with the arrow, the chewing gum, spearmint. Pew. There used to be some people, unbelievable lazga. And even from the time of Rasulullah, the Arab was a lazga. He won't let go of you. The Quran had to come in and said, hey, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You've eaten, now go home. Why? Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is too polite to just tell you guys get out. True? It's too soft-hearted. What you used to do, used to hurt the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. The Prophet was shy to tell you, go. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just going to say to you, now you can go out. Then this is the ayah. If you ask for anything from the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, فَاسْأَلُوهُنَّ مِنْ وَرَائِي What? Hijab. If someone's looking for hijab in the Quran as head covering, no. If you're looking for the original meaning of hijab as a barrier, physical, social, akhlaqi, then it's here. <coughs> that you don't just talk to the wives of Rasulullah like that. There has to be a veil covering between you and them. We agree on this? The Prophet then, having explained that hijab is about the way you talk to someone, about your akhlaq, about when you go to someone's house, you don't just sit there, yalla, you know what, ladies come and sit, guys come and sit, let's all eat food together. There has to be a certain amount of respect in the way people talk to each other and so on and so forth. A few verses later, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, now the physical part we begin discussing. Because it's all well and good you having good akhlaq and a good heart, but if everybody is able to see your finer part, those whose hearts have a disease the men that we mentioned last night then they're going to be affected by this so in verse 59 what happened in verse 59 of the same surah ya ayyuhan nabiyyu you see the difference in the way female hijab we discuss its development in the quran and how we normally hear it in mosques in mosques you never hear about the development normally in mosques you just say hijab wajib if you don't you'll burn in hell 
يا أيها النبي قل لأزواجك O Prophet of God say to your wives only your wives now now we begin talking to the community وبناتك and to your daughters ونساء المؤمنين and the daughters and who and the woman of the believers يدنين عليهن من جلابي بهن let them do what let them put on them an outer garment. Which are we introduced to here? Ladies used to cover their head, but their ears used to show. And what else used to show? Here there's an instruction. Now wear another garment, another form of clothing. A form of clothing that maybe starts from here all the way down. You know, sometimes there are ladies, they wear abaya. Abaya can be worn like this, or you could put it from here and it covers. A jilbab is a garment that is worn on top of what you're already wearing. Today, if I go to the Gulf states, I see them wearing abaya. Are they wearing anything under that abaya? Yes. You might wear a t-shirt and jeans under the abaya. You might wear, for example, whatever under that abaya. But the abaya is what this verse was trying to talk about. That it's not sufficient to only wear one garment let's say a top and jeans in some countries because maybe here in, in Arabia in Arabia maybe that was not sufficient maybe in other countries you might find that that is sufficient but the biggest problem with that is if the weather changes something gets blown away someone can see the shape of the body and so on so what was introduced a jilbab I must also say that part of the revelation of this verse was because the slave Girls, what did I say? The slave girls, were they wearing hijab or not? No. So if you were an Arabian lady and you weren't necessarily covered up properly, they would sometimes see you as a slave girl. If you were a slave girl, you weren't covered up, it was easy for the men to come and chirp you, for the men to come and harass you. Why? She's a slave. Who's her master? Who's her brothers? Nobody. They're not powerful. Because, you know, if you want to go and talk to a girl and you know she's got brothers who are going to come after you, you're not going to go talk to that girl. But when you realize that she's got nobody, you find it a bit, easier in that time if they saw a lady not covered up properly what would they assume sometimes she must be like the slave girl so i'm gonna go and chirps her up i'm gonna go and harass her so the quran came and said that do this because a it differentiates you from the slave girls and b it is better for them so that they are not what ultimately hijab wasn't about sex or about physical desire, but rather the dignity of the person. This will ensure, because you're wearing a number of garments, not everybody can necessarily see the way your body is shaped. We saw, for example, campaigns a few years ago in certain parts of the world where ladies to get job roles or in certain films were harassed. There was a campaign that at work, ladies in high positions were constantly harassed because they were a female. They were harassed because they were a female and that the men couldn't think of anything else except physical desires in relation to that lady. It's as if 1400 years ago, Islam has already discussed this by saying, you know what, wear a jilbab, meaning that you could go to work and you could wear a t-shirt and jeans. You could go to work and wear this really smart suit and smart, smart trousers. You could go to work and look very fashionable. Just wear an outer garment on top of that. Because even sometimes if you're working, you can still be working as a lady in a very high position with the highest respect. But you know, sometimes you may be in positions, whether we like it or not, you're going down to pick up a file. The guy can see you. If he sees you and you're not wearing much, you're bending down to pick up a file, everyone can see your cleavage. You're bending down the other way, guys are looking from behind. The Quran had mentioned men have hearts with diseases in many cases. So we're trying to cover not just society, we're protecting you as well. You don't want someone to be hurt. You want that person protected. I don't want to work from nine to five and have every guy literally just staring at me. Wallah, there are some people, believe you me, it's not you don't have to be some supermodel looking lady to be harassed at work. Because not every guy is a supermodel looking guy. There are guys who have frustrations and they have their desires and so on. We addressed them last night because they are part of the problem that you can't just talk about the female's hijab if the male hijab is not being observed. But it's not helping if you're walking into work and you're, 
unfortunately, some of what may be worn, even if that person is a respectful, modest person, with the animals that are out there, those animals, they'll take advantage of this. And so the Quran tried to react by saying that wear an outer garment. We still have a problem. What if I wear an outer garment but my neck area is still showing? My area from my neck and my, uh, my area from my ears, my neck, all this area showing. And who else can see me actually? And is there limits on who can see me? These were questions that had to be posed. Where were they addressed? Surah 24 of the Quran. Let's all go to Surah 24. In Surah 24 of the Quran from about yesterday, what did we say? We said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first addresses the hijab. I ask you, Yasser, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed the hijab of woman first or the hijab of men first? Men, ahsent. The hijab of men was first discussed. Surah 24 verse 30. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارَهِمْ Say to the men to lower from their gaze. Firstly, the men hijab. Then after that, verse 31, is the verse that discusses what? That discusses what we know today as female hijab. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ You know something very interesting, Hassan. Something very interesting is that verse 30 said, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ Mu'mineen includes females as well, you could argue. But Allah is stressing that this message also has to be passed because both of you have to do this in tandem with each other. قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْضُضْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ It's not just men who have to lower from their gaze. Yani I know that a lot, the men in many cases are the ones who are staring. But we cannot deny that it can be the other way around as well. It takes two to tango. Sometimes the girl also has to have had a look at you as well. In the same way yesterday we said lower the gaze doesn't mean I look down. Lower means make it softer. Don't stare at someone like a perv. Make it a bit softer. You can look at someone. There's no harm looking at someone but don't make it something where it shows you have a disease in your heart. Would you like another guy to look at your own sister like that? قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْضُضْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ يَغْضُضْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ means also that there may be certain things that you may say the aura of the man is that the man from the belly button to just below, for example, the navel area, that area has to be covered, let's say. What if, for example, I'm looking at men doing latom? They're doing matam as a female. Am I allowed to be looking at them bare-chested, sweating, bleeding? Again, here the Quran is saying, tell the believing woman to lower from their gaze. If the man isn't allowed to see a scene from a film where a lady is taking off her clothing, for example, then likewise, a female, if she's looking at things like this, you may say, but I'm not looking at it for the wrong reason. But you could be tempted if you're standing there in a crowd looking at a group of men with their tops off. That's why some mosques will not have latom with men taking their tops off because there may be ladies at the back. And can I, as for example, if there's a lady who says, you know, just wait for the scene when he takes his top off, just look how buff he looks. Quran says, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْضُضْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارَهِنَّ Hijab, isn't that just you cover your hair because mommy is going to kill you if you re re reveal your hair or the community will look down at you? No. There is also the hijab of the eyes. قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْضُضْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارَهِنَّ وَيَحْفَظْنَ same way that the men have to guard their private parts, the female has to guard her private parts as well. At the end of the day, adultery or fornication is something that can affect the males and it can affect the females. Then we begin. Zina. What do we normally describe or translate zina as? What is zina normally? If you put zina in a, in a, in a masjid, what, what have you done to that masjid? Decoration, beautification, do you agree? So if I put zina in a masjid or I put zina in my house, what does it mean if I put zina all over my house? I've beautified the house. I've decorated the house. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْضُضْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ وَيَحْفَظْنَ فَرُوجَهُنَّ and he continues, وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ 
illa ma zahara minha and for them to cover their areas of beautification except that is that which is customary or a customary practice what does that mean this has been the subject of huge debate illa ma zahara minha many believe that you have to cover in female hijab you cover all the areas of beautification except the face and the hands because the face and the hands are seen as the customary areas which are not covered but everything else of beautification has to be covered some ulama like ayatollah al-khoi believed that even the face had to be covered and to the extent that they say that ayatollah al-khoi was of the opinion ayatollah sistani of the opinion that if you believe your wife has a certain level of beauty that will bring too much attention, then she has to cover her face as well. Now, a bit of a catch-22, that opinion, because my wife will probably be looking at me and thinking, hold on a minute. If you believe your wife is at that level of beauty a bit more than normal, that she has to cover her face, your wife will be looking at you and so, do you think I have to cover my face or no? <laughs> on the one hand, on the one hand, you're thinking, if I say no, then she's going to be thinking, don't you think I'm that beautiful? And if I say yes, she might be thinking, well, why, why do you tell me you want me to cover my face? I've seen maybe seven, eight ulama in history who believed that covering the face was to be taken from this ayah. And I'm going to come to that part a bit later in the ayah. Majority of ulama believe that the ayah is saying is that you cover the areas which are beautifying you except the face and the hands. Question, what if I've got eyelash extensions? So the face is allowed to be shown. You know, late, our moms, normally you see them wearing hijab, but their faces are showing. Do you agree? But what if you get those eyelash extension things? That's beautification. Do you agree? But the face is allowed to be shown. What if I put makeup on the face? But the face is allowed to be shown. The face is allowed to be shown, but that zina, if it's placed on the face, then there's a problem. That's why many ladies in our community, for example, in the Iraqi community, I think we had a very good level of this particular part of the ayah, that many of them, when they would go to weddings, your face is covered in makeup. You may even have done your eyelashes. You may even have put, you know, different forms of makeup. Many of them will cover or wear a bushi or something as they're entering the wedding hall and as they leave the wedding hall. A niqab, a burqa, whatever you want to call it. Why? Because they recognize, وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا A question. Most people who attack hijab, most of them, their only conception is there's no word hijab in the Quran. Then all these discussions about zina and all these discussions about illama dhari, what are all these discussions? These are just random discussions? Yeah, and surely these discussions have a significance for us as well. So therefore, if your wife wants to go to a wedding, and we know that everybody in a wedding is glammed up, even a person like me can look good in a wedding. Everybody is glammed up in a wedding. So when everybody is glammed up in a wedding, that is the moment where a person may, may have to employ certain other forms of covering. Because why? Because the Quran said, وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا Someone says, Sayyidina, but I see some ladies don't care. Forget wedding. They're wearing makeup wherever they go out. We know that for us, the traditions, you may find... For example, I'm not going to say never has makeup been allowed, nor am I going to say that someone is completely full of makeup. There may be some people who have blemishes on their face, which may need to be covered. There may be certain traditions that may talk of kohol, for example, or other things that one may put on their eyes, for example. But all in all, it is generally seen that if this is a form of zina, of course, there may be other forms of zina that someone is, is making apparent. Yep. But we still have a problem here. Forget makeup. You show me a lady who her cleavage area is showing, I'm still going to be attracted in all honesty. And that's what the Quran went on to address. What did we say the khimar was? Who could tell me? Head covering. 
So in terms of someone says to you, show me hijab in the Quran, say, bro, you got it wrong. The Arabs in head covering used to call it khimar, not hijab. You want me to show you khimar? Someone says, bro, why would you call it khimar? In the Quran, I'd say around Surah 2 verse 290. Surah 2 verse 290 of the Quran, you'll find a verse that many of us, I think, can relate to, my dear brothers and sisters. Hold on. Have I? No. Surah 2 verse 219, sorry. Why did I say 290? Surah 2 verse 219, because for a second I was thinking, hold on a minute. If it's Baqarah, it cannot be 290. So, Surah 2 verse 219. Um, Minhal, can you read it for me, please? Yes? Surah 2, verse 219. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ahsant. Yas'alunaka anil khamr. What's khamr? Intoxicant, which we call today alcohol. Do you agree? Go back, go back, go back to Surah 33, uh, to Surah 24, verse number 31. Go back. What did we say head covering was called? Khimar. What's alcohol? Khamr. What's head covering? What's alcohol? What's head covering? What's alcohol? What are we doing here? No, only joking. Alcohol, khamur. Head covering. You're looking for a video on YouTube saying, show me hijab in the Quran. You've got the wrong video. You've got to be saying, show me khimar because the Arabs' head covering was called a khimar. Khamur is called alcohol today or why, do, why is it uh, known as an intoxicant? What does alcohol do to your head? I want, it, I want you to say it literally as per my interpretation of khimar. Literally, what does alcohol do to someone's head? Literally, literally. As the same definition as khimar. Covers your head. Bro, you know what? I can't see properly, man. Covers my head what? Means my rational reasoning suddenly gets blocked. My signals and my senses are all over the place. Bro, I'm drunk, man. I don't even know the way home. Huwabeta's across the road. His house is across the road. Bro, I don't know where I am. Head is covered. Head is foggy. Head is clouded. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What did he say? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, let them draw their khimar over their jiyub. Jiyub, we said, was the chest cavity. Don't you agree? Let them draw their veil over their chest. said again. And for them not to display their beautifying features. Illa, except to who? Except to their husbands. Yep, we agree. Can a lady show her beautiful areas to her husband? Yes. Can a lady show her beautiful areas or her adornment to her father? Yeah. What? To the in-laws, can you show? Yeah. To your sons, can you show? Yeah. Let's say the area where there has to be a covering, let's say, is from below the chest to the knees. That means even the question of a bikini in front of your sons, Islam has an issue with. Bikini in the sense that this area of privacy, you're just saying, that, but that's my son. La, la, la. No, we have certain criteria. But we're just going swimming together. That, that's criteria. Okay, so you have here who? The sons of their husbands. Let's say stepchildren. Allowed. Oh, oh their brothers. Allowed. Yep. Oh, Benny. Oh, your nephews and nieces allowed? Yep, they're allowed to see you without. Oh, my Malakat. Or their slaves. They're allowed to see them. Oh, or for example, who? Let's say there might be a eunuch 
who doesn't really have any feelings from the men is castrated or whatever what lam yadharu ala awrad nisa or the younger kids not the ones who've reached the age of bulugh a kid who is baligh okay in some cases you have to watch what you're wearing those who don't have any of these feelings you may be a bit more free with so if we differentiate what we said earlier that if i'm going to wear a swimsuit there's a difference between my 2 year old and my 15 year old ولا يضربن بأرجلهن ليعلم ما يخفين من زينتهن and let them not what strike their feet in walking that's what they hide of their adornments gets apparent that sometimes the, sh the ladies might wear things which are high heels heels and there's many ladies love this high heels but the Quran has discussed the heels and discussed even anklets you might wear a bracelet on your ankle the Quran discussed it subhan 1400 years ago because you could be walking and there is a lady walking you don't hear anything but if you hear cluck 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 you turn around just have a look you know there's someone walking there what's interesting is that the Quran says that even things around your ankle even high heel shoes even those things the very fact that a person can turn towards them is not what they see of what's making the noise rather it is what that that gives them a hint of what they may not be showing i may look at that noise or look at that movement and it may open a world to me of what they're not showing it draws more attention to me more attraction there could be a lady covering her face tick covering her hair tick but if she's moving around and she is making that noise when she's moving around there could be a possibility that even without seeing her i still have a feeling inside for what may be under that covering Therefore, the main verse discussing the physical was what? Was this one. The others discussed the social. What do we have in terms now? One of the terms is khimar, head covering. One of the terms for outer covering was what? Jilbab. Add them together, what do you get? The barrier that's known as physical and social? Hijab. Therefore, is there anyone exempt from wearing hijab in our communities? Yes. If a lady is about 70, 80, verse number 60 of the same surah. Same surah, just go to verse number 60 and we'll conclude with this. Verse number 61. Uh, 60, yes. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal-qawa'idu min al nisai It gives you this impression of your grandma who's like just not moving. Sometimes our grandmas reach an age where it's like, Gran, are you ever going to get up? You're just sitting at home. Now, the poor grandma is old, or poor grandma's just not bothered to get up because she's got so many grandchildren around. You, bring me tea. You, bring me high. You, bring me this. So the Quran made it very vivid. Wal-qawa'id min al nisai The qawa'id, my dear brothers and sisters, maybe our moms or our grandmas when they reach about 70 or 80, is hijab the way it's worn, you know, for example, with the khimar and the jilbab, that wajib on them? Not necessarily. Sometimes you'll see your grand. Maybe her uh, hijab goes back a little bit. You know, she's reached an age which is what the Quran says. They've passed the age of childbearing and they don't hope for marriage anymore. You talk to your ma grandma, she's like, I've spent too much time with your granddad. Don't give me another headache, please. In some cases, when they get to that age 70, 80, whatever, then the Quran said that for these, it's a different story. Yes, they may still wear something which covers them, a garment. So therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, when we look at all of these, we see the evolution of hijab. I still think there are many nuances in the discussion, especially if you go in the world of fiqh, you'll see in the sections of prayer, the sections of marriage, there are still interesting hadiths there about the nuances involved. But all in all, it's sufficient within ahzab and sufficient within nur that you'll see more than enough that guides us how to physically and socially remain modest without being judgmental of everyone's development, inshallah. And hopefully in this month of Ramadan, for the sisters and the brothers at home, we could take it as a resolution to work on our hijab. We'll see you all tomorrow, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. <laughs>
Karbala, once a barren land, a land once uninhabited. Yet today, millions assemble and congregate in it. But why? A holy trail left from Medina and mark the journey of ablation, submission and sacrifice. The focal point of hearts set a journey towards this land. Imam Hussein TV is excited and honored to be inviting you to an opportunity like no other. For many of you who have visited Karbala, you would have seen the building works around the front of Imam Hussein's shrine. The Haram is now expanding and currently Tel Zainabiya Sanctorium is being recreated. With the new plans and development, Imam Hussein Media Group is relocating to the Dar al sajjad building on Qibla Street. One of the main roads that leads to the front of the holy shrines of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Our building will only be 150 meters away from the holy shrine of Aba Abdullah. This new building is to be the new headquarters for the Imam Hussein Media Group, taking up 200 square meters. The purchase of just the land alone in 2012 was a total of over 2.2 million US dollars. The 11-story building overlooks the holy sites of the sacred tents of Imam al Hussein, Bain al Haramain, and the two holy domes of Imam Hussein and his brother Abu Fadl al Abbas. The building will consist of 11 floors and a basement. The basement will be dedicated to serving the blessed pilgrims visiting the holy city of Karbala and will hold an equipment storage and repair facility. The ground floor of the building will hold a Husseiniyya which will be open all year round to hold majalis and celebrations. The first floor will have a built-in amphitheatre seating 200 people. It will be used to premiere certain shows and documentaries as well as hosting international conferences and seminars. The second floor will hold an equipment storage and repair facility. The third floor will host our Farsi channel, Imam Hussein TV One. The channel requires office space, meeting rooms, as well as editorial suites to create new material for your viewing. The fourth floor will host our Arabic channel, Imam Hussein TV Two. The fifth floor will host our English channel and our Urdu channel. This is where all post-production will happen. The sixth floor will host our Azawi channel, Az Zahra TV and our news channel, Shia Waves News. The channels require office space, meeting rooms, as well as editorial suites to help plan, create, and manage different stages of production to bring you the latest news affecting the Shia community globally. The seventh and eighth floors will be split into two parts. The majority of both floors will be home to the Al Mukhayyam Studios. This space will hold two visual studios overlooking the holy shrines and will be used to have live broadcasts and pre-recorded filming sets. A small section of the double-floored studio will be the control room, which is where the technicians record, mix, edit and televise live broadcasting. The ninth and tenth floors will also be split into two parts. The majority of these floors will be home to the Bab Al Qibla studios. This large size studio will include window backdrops showing the holy shrines of Imam Hussein and Abu Fadl Al Abbas. This will be used by all channels when holding ziyara and special programs to celebrate or commemorate the Ahlul Bayt. A small section of the double floored studio will be the control room, which will also be used for technicians to record, mix, edit and televise live broadcasting. Here's where you can help. Many of us make investments for the future to see a return. Our hereafter is our real future. And here is an investment opportunity like no other. It's costing Imam Hussein Media Group $700 per square meter to construct and decorate the building. The $700 will account for cement to bricks, from iron beams to cabling, and even plastering, painting, and tiling. You can donate to our project and receive blessings and rewards with every single second any production is being created in this building. Whether we are script writing, filming, editing, or broadcasting a live show on the day of Arba'een, your donation will raise blessings and rewards for the hereafter. But I'm sure you're asking yourselves, why do we need such a building? 
Since its inception, Imam Hussein Media Group has grown to a multilingual and internationally recognized station. Our sole duty is to provide an interactive platform to teach people the message of the Ahlul Bayt. The new building will give each channel their own space and equipment to work effectively and efficiently. With more space, each department will have ample time and freedom to be able to create more interesting and valuable content to bring you all closer to the Ahlul Bayt. In today's world, falsehood is abundant. And through Imam Hussein TV, we have the ability to show people the truth. It was once the wealth of Sayyidah Khadija that pushed forward the message of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And today, we ask you to help us push the message of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. All that is required is just over $900,000 to finalize the total project. And with so many lovers of Imam Hussein, and with so many contributions from these lovers, we are sure we can reach our goal. Invest in the future of your community. Invest in your afterlife and invest in the legacy of your Imam. Imam Hussein TV, your gateway to Karbala.